So I am, I am glad that you guys are here today. We are uh, beginning a brand new series this week uh, that I believe has the, the potential to speak to many of you in a, in a major way, uh, to have massive impact um, on your life. Um, and we're going to talk uh, for the next four weeks about loving people um, because God loves us. So we're, we're called to love people. And I wonder how many of you today recognize that some people are just a little more difficult to love than others. Uh, you, so, so you all come across somebody like that. So that's what we're talking about for, for the next few weeks. Uh, we're talking about haunting uh, relationships because there are some relationships that just haunt us. Like we go to bed at night thinking, I've got to deal with that person tomorrow. Or we go to bed at night and think, that person's laying right next to me. Like, <laughs> you know, one, one of the things that, that I love, and I'm going to uh, fill you in a little bit about me, uh, I love horror movies. Um, I, yeah, and the gorier, the better, like the scarier, the better. My daughter and I, we stay up uh, late a lot, a lot of times watching horror movies. And I know you're thinking, you're, you're an awful person. You should like go, ahead. Shh, quit. <laughs> that and serial killers. Like, I, I love serial killers. Any show I can watch on serial killers, I love. And, and part of it is because I think that they have this thing about them. Um, and, and Sandy, I'm sorry, none of this is in the notes. So um, they have this thing about them like, hey, I'm not going to deal with those kind of haunting people. Like, life would be easier if we were all just serial killers, wouldn't it? I'm not condoning being a serial killer by any means. But there are just some relationships in life that just kind of suck the life right out of you. And, and let me tell you where we're going to go next week. Next week, we're going to talk about loving the overly critical people. Like, they're always picking us apart. They always find something wrong with, with what you're doing or, or how you're doing it. Um, and then the, the week after that, number three, we're going to talk about uh, overly needy people. It doesn't matter how much you give them or what you do for them. They always want or need or, or, or just they just need more and more and more. So we're going to talk about that. How do, how do we love them uh, appropriately? Um, and week four, we're going to talk about loving people who are, are hypocrites, uh, loving the, the hypocrite. And like, how do we do that? Like, because maybe there's some people in your life that they call themselves Christians, but their life doesn't reflect that a whole lot. So what, what's our role? How, how do we help them find life? How, how do we love those people? But today I want to dive in with something that, that many people face, and it is how do we love the incredibly controlling people uh, around us? I, I, just, I, I want to see if I can get you to participate this morning. Like this is church, um, but here, if you're new, like we're just honest. And like I said, we're, we're all messed up. Like, so don't pretend you're not. Um, we, we all of everyone in here is. So I want to see if I can get you to participate. How many of you know someone who is a control freak? Many of you are looking at him right now. Um, and, and, and that's okay. We're going to talk about me later on. If you tried to raise your hand and the person next to you like held your arm down, you're sitting next to the person that's a control freak. Like those are the people we're talking about today. But, but unfortunately, and we make light of it sometimes, but unfortunately so many people have been hurt by people who tried to control you. You know, maybe, uh, maybe someone who is in an authoritative role in your life, they, they've abused that authority and they hurt you. Uh, maybe other people that are trying to control you, maybe they're not malicious or maybe it's not even intentional on their part. And sometimes they're just needy. And sometimes they're just insecure. Sometimes they're just hurting people themselves, uh, trying to, to make it through life. And, and they're just kind of an emotional black hole. And we pour into them. And no matter what we do, it's not enough. And if we give them an inch, they crave more. And if, and if, we don't, if they don't get their way, what happens is that they, they pout or they complain or they'll stomp or they'll whine and sometimes they'll give you the silent treatment sometimes they'll they'll walk away and all the time they, that you're around this type of person you feel like you're walking on eggshells you're wondering what what's next how do we love those people that try to control us and let's start by building a foundation for that really there there are two weapons that, that the controlling person uses to take control 
Two, two weapons, and you probably know this, especially if, you, if you've been in a relationship with a controlling person, is they, they use threats. They use threats. How do threats manifest? In some form or fashion, they may say it or they may imply it, but they, it's this. If you don't do what I want you to do, there's going to be punishment. If you don't do what, what I want you to do, how I want you to do it, you're going to, you're going to regret it. You better perform or things aren't going to be good between us. It may be a boyfriend who says, hey, if you don't do what I want you to do sexually, I'm breaking up with you. It may be a boss who, who is always terrifying you and making you feel like you're going to get fired or, or demoted. And like you're always on, on edge. It may be a spouse that's always threatening to leave. Whatever it is, one of the manipulators or controllers' greatest weapons is a threat. And they also use guilt. Threats and guilt are, are their two major things. I love that song we sang, No Guilt in Life. But if you're in a relationship with a controller, like they'll use guilt. They may say it or they'll imply it. Like after all I've done for you, you won't do this one thing for me. I mean, we're, I mean, we're friends, right? I, I thought you liked me. Or maybe it's even, even grandma that says, man, I, I haven't heard from you in, in two weeks. I could be rotten here in this house and die and nobody would ever find me until I was stinking. <laughs> like there's threats and guilt. So how do we as followers of Christ love those who intentionally or unintentionally try to control us and manipulate us? And what I want to do is I want to look at a story in Matthew's gospel this morning in chapter uh, 16, and it involves Jesus and one of his disciples, uh, one that we've talked about a lot over the last couple of weeks, actually, Peter. Jesus is very clearly explaining uh, to his disciples, he said, hey, I've got to do the will of God. Like, I'm getting ready uh, to, to be, and this is kind of the context, he was explaining to them that we're going to go, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to suffer and die. He was going to give his life, like, that's what he's saying, is I'm going to give my life uh, for, for everyone, and God's going to raise me from the dead. And Peter looks on and essentially says, oh, no, you don't. We're, that's not going to happen. I will never let that happen to you. So Jesus is clearly explaining to Peter what's going on. And Peter's saying, no, I'm going to take control. And I'm going to make sure this doesn't happen. And here's how it goes in Matthew 16, starting verse 21. It says, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. And you may notice this in your life, that that's what a controller wants to do. Like they often want to isolate you from everyone else. And that's what Peter's doing. He took Jesus aside and, and rebuked him. He said, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Like, this isn't what I want. Peter said, no, it's not my want, it's not my will. I'm not going to allow this to happen to you. And what did Jesus do? Because this is where we learn. Whenever Peter tried to manipulate him away from God's will, this is what Jesus did. He turned to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciple, whoever, his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So how do we love those who are trying to control and manipulate us? From this story, what I want to do is I want to show you three things that are, that are very important that we need to know how to do and if we're going to love people who are trying to control us. And the first thing, if you're taking notes, is that we need to know what we are called to do. Like we need to understand, we need to know what we were called to do. Jesus was so clear on what his calling was. And I love it because over and over again, as you read the gospels, Jesus would say it in different ways, but very clear, very purposefully what his mission was. See, I came to seek and save the lost. He said, I didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous before the sinner. I didn't come so that people could serve me. I came so that I could serve other people. Jesus was incredibly clear on what his calling and what his purpose in life was, about why he came. 
And that's what, what he was describing to Peter. He said, I've got to give my life. I've, I've got to uh, die and God's going to bring me back to life. For us to love those who are trying to control us, listen, it's really important that you clearly define your calling, that you know what you are called to do. And a lot of times I think people get mistaken over, over this area of God's calling. There are uh, really uh, two callings, I believe, that, that everybody has in their life. And the first one, the primary calling for everyone in here is not very difficult, is that you point people to Jesus. Like that is your primary call in life. Secondary calling is, is maybe what, how you do that. Like maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're a nurse, maybe you're working in the local church, maybe you're, you're working in a factory, maybe you're, like there are other calls, it's a secondary calling. And people get so hung up on that secondary calling and some people think, well, I, I'm supposed to be a missionary to Uganda. And, and maybe you are. But that doesn't thwart the, the primary calling that you have on your life to point people to Jesus. Um, like I'm supposed to have a cure for cancer or something like that. Again, I would argue that, that our calling isn't always that specific, uh, except for the fact that we're called to point people to Jesus. And sometimes it, it's the, the people that are closest to us. Like maybe your calling, and I, and I promise you your calling, is to love your wife, just as Christ loved the church. Your calling might be to lead your children. I promise you your calling is to lead your children to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe you're calling in this season of your life, it's the secondary calling. Maybe it's to be a good student and, and to get good grades and to graduate from college. Like, because you're building a foundation to which to build upon. Your calling might be to work, but it's always to witness. Like, I don't believe we're called to a job. I believe we're called to, to a position as sons and daughters of the Most High God to point people to him through his son, Jesus Christ. And we have to clearly identify and clearly understand what that calling is. Now, I believe that my calling is very clear in life. It is to uh, lay down my life to serve my bride, Jennifer. Like I'm to lead my children to become fully devoted followers of Christ. And my calling is to, to pastor and lead in the church. Like that's my calling. Love Jennifer, lead my kids, lead the church. And the problem is though, is that I'm a people pleaser. The problem is many of you are people pleasers. In fact, how many of you would say that, that you battle with, with pleasing people? How many of you just raised your hand to make me feel better? <laughs> like, like pleasing people. Like many of us battle with that being a people pleaser. And what we need to understand is that pleasing people or people pleasing is a form of idolatry. What's it doing? It's, it's we're wrongly putting other people's opinions ahead of God's calling for us to, to win people to him. So if you look at me, like a lot of people have a very clear view or clear opinion of what my job ought to be and how I ought to lead and what I want to do. Like there are people who want, want to control and say that I should do this, so you should go here, you should do this. But I've learned over the years, but I've got to have a very clear plan and clear direction and clear calling on my life. Because here's the thing, I cannot do everything. I cannot please everybody and neither can you. I cannot serve everybody. And honestly, I, I wish I could. Like I wish I could go around just saving everybody, but I can't. Like, are, are you with me? Do you understand that, that so many people have a calling for your life that may not be the calling that God has for your life? But you know what I can do? I can love my bride. I can lead my children and I can lead the church. I can use the gifts that I have to do what, what I'm uniquely called to do in pastoring a congregation. And you need to know what you're called to do. And why does this matter? Because what does every person, the controlling person have in common? Every one of them has something in common. And it is, are you ready for it? Every controlling person has someone who allows it. 
Everyone who's controlling has someone in their life who, who allows them to control. And that's why calling is so important. When you clarify your calling, when you know what God's called you to do in this season, when you know what God's blessed you to do in this season, when you clarify your calling, it'll keep you from being distracted away from the calling that other people have on your life. So what are you called to do? The second thing is know when someone is trying to control you. Like you have to recognize and acknowledge when someone else is trying to push their agenda onto you and to, to drag you away from what God wants. That's what's going on in the story here. Jesus says, he says, hey, this is what God's calling me to do. I'm gonna lay down my life and God's gonna raise me up. And, and then what does Peter do? Peter stands Jesus down and says, no, 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 no. Like that's not gonna happen. Never, ever, ever. Now ask yourself, was Peter the worst guy that ever lived? Now he was, he was messed up, but, but he wasn't that bad, really. Was it his intentional plan to distract Jesus away from what God was calling Jesus to do? Nope. In fact, just right before this, and we talked about it last week, like Peter won Jesus' jeopardy. Like he did, like Jesus said, hey, who do people say that I am? And some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus said, hey, but what about you? And Peter got the answer right. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Like we're talking just five, six verses before this. And Jesus said, Peter, you're right. And on that statement, I'm gonna build my church in the gates of Hades or hell. They will not come against it. So Peter was right. He wasn't intentionally trying to do anything to harm Jesus, to drag Jesus away. And that's why we have to recognize it. It may be a really good person, a person that, that we love and that loves us, but we need to recognize when unintentionally or even intentionally, they are threatening us or, or they're even trying to guilt us into doing something or they're trying to just isolate us from our friends or manipulate us to rescue them again or, or to meet their need that you were never designed to meet. Like you really have to know your calling like, this is my lane, this is my purpose, and, and this is what I'm doing. And you, even, even though I love you, you're not gonna distract me from the higher calling that God's given me. And the third thing, and this is where it gets a little bit more difficult, but it's the loving thing to do. The third thing is you need to know when it's time to draw a line in the sand. You know when it's time to draw a line in the sand. And this is exactly what Jesus does to Peter. Jesus says, hey, this is what I'm called to do. Peter says, no, 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 no. What, what you want, what I want, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, hey, get behind me, Satan. That's kind of fun to say. Like, get behind me, Satan. Like, go ahead, just look at somebody and tell them that right now. Go ahead, like, go ahead, tell them. Like, get behind me, Satan. Yeah, it's fun to say. You guys are missing out on all the fun today. But he says, you don't have the concerns of God in mind. You only have your own or the concerns of man inside. So next time grandma says, hey, I haven't heard from you in two weeks and she's trying to guilt you into it, just say, hey, grandma, get behind me, Satan. Like, I'm kidding. Don't, don't call your grandma Satan. It, it never goes well, especially at Christmas. Um, but Jesus says this. He says, Peter, get, get behind me. But imagine if, if Jesus was kind of codependent like most of us are. I imagine what that would have looked like. Hey, Jesus, don't do this. I don't want you to do that. And Jesus is like, well, okay, don't get upset. I, I won't die. And Peter says, hey, Jesus, I'm gonna unfollow you on, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook if, if you go do that. He says, well, don't do that. Oh, Peter, let's just sit down. Let's have some tea together. You, you want me to do more miracles? Okay, we'll just go around doing more miracles. Whatever you want, Peter, just don't, just don't leave me. You know, what if Jesus was codependent and his identity was wrongly wrapped up in, in who Peter was or who Peter thought he should be? But listen, he would never do that because the moment that he gave control to someone else and someone else is di directing him and, and God's not leading him, and that's why this is so incredibly dangerous. Like we need to know what we're called to do. We need to recognize when someone's trying to control us. And Jesus says, hey, even though you just won Jesus jeopardy, I've got to draw a line in the sand right here. 
I cannot allow you to take me away from what God's called me to do. And what if in your life there's someone that, that you love and, and that you care about, someone that even loves and cares about you, but in their dysfunction, they're distracting you from serving a higher calling and a higher purpose. Because maybe because you idolize what they think and you've lessened and you've walked away from God because of them. And Jesus looks on to to Peter and he's in this moment, he says, you don't have in mind the things of God. So what do we do? Where do we go when when we recognize that we've got an unhealthy dance going on with somebody? When someone threatens us, when someone makes us feel guilty, we give in and, and perhaps we're doing, uh, not doing what God called us to do. Let me give you a couple of thoughts. And for somebody, this is going to be freeing. For, for somebody here, God's going to do something. I think God's going to shake you. God's going to give you boldness and courage to, to confront this controlling relationship. So what do we need to know? First of all, we need to know, and this is true in any relationship, that the relationships that you have are a combination of what you've created and what you've allowed. Think about it. Every relationship you have, your, your marriage, your siblings, uh, the relationship you have with your boss, your coworkers, your friends, they're all, always a combination of what you either rightly or purposefully created or what you have passively allowed. Like we create patterns. We create healthy patterns or, or we allow unhealthy ones. Every relationship you have, the person that drives you crazy, your your mother-in-law that's getting up in your business, your spouse that you love and yet you can continue to do this, like what, what, what do you have? It's a combination of what you've created and what you've allowed. And the next thought is this, and this is where the application comes in. If you don't like what you have, change what you accept and what you expect. Change what you expect and what you accept. If you don't like what you have, change it. Know when to draw a line in the sand. Jesus loved Peter. He loved him. Like, and you got the answer right, Peter. God revealed that to you. That wasn't by man. And a moment later, Peter's like, no, 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 that's that's not appropriate. But Jesus would say, hey, I'm not letting you in your desire, even though it's a good desire, even though you you have my best interest in mind, I'm not going to allow you to, to drag me away from what God's called me to do. And how do we do that? Man, it's, I'm not going to let you talk to me that way. I love you, but that's inappropriate. I care about you, but I'm not going that way. And listen, I know this is difficult, but it's difficult because you love them. Hey, I'm not going to bail you out again. Like you can yell, you can scream, you can kick, but I want you to know that I'm going to consistently express my love for you, but I'm not going to tolerate this. You know, we do that with two years old in the grocery stores, right? Are your two year old sitting there in the cart? I want candy now. And as parents, we say no, unless it goes on for 20 minutes. And then like every parent gives in because the terrorist is done taking control. And you whisper to them, someday, there's not going to be anybody around and I'm going to wear you out. <laughs> but you don't tolerate that because we expect more. And so we've got to expect more and we've got to, we cannot accept that kind of behavior any longer. You know, hey, I, we don't use the divorce word in our marriage. You can't threaten me like that. I love you so much, but you can't yell at me. You can't threaten me like this. I'm not gonna own the guilt any longer that you've been trying to place on me. Like, I'm gonna love you consistently. And listen, when you do that, listen, this is, this is what happens. I'm gonna tell you, it's not very fun. When you do that, when you draw a line in the sand, the controlling person gets very angry. And, and a lot of times they're gonna double down on their dysfunctional behavior. Am I the only one that's had these people in my life? Like, you all you are kind of quiet today. So you're going to draw a line in the sand, and you say, that's not, not going to happen. And a lot of times, whatever it is, whatever their, their MO is, that it's going to become their attitude. 
And why are they going to act like that? Listen, because they're hurt. And you're redefining the, the dance. Like for a long time, many of you, you've had this dysfunctional, codependent dance with someone, and you're trying to change it to something that's healthy. And they're hurting. And is that difficult? Man, it's always difficult. It's always, it's always hard. But if you love them, you're going to redefine the dance. You're going to take it from dysfunction to, to function. We have to love them enough when, to, to know when to draw the line in the sand. Now let's get real for a minute. It's easy to talk about control freaks. But every now and then when I look in the mirror, like I have tattooed across my forehead a control freak. And does anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, people, people say this. Um, they say, well, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And I, and I relate to that. And God loves you and, and I have a wonderful plan for your life too. Like I, I, I want everybody doing what I want everybody to do. And my wife would say, if she was here, she's sick this morning. Hopefully she'll feel better for the next service. But my wife would say, amen. And my kids would say, amen. And probably the people that I work with would say, amen. Like anybody who, who's around me would say, amen, uh, because I want them to fall into a pattern in, in, that, that I see for their life. And the reason I want them to do that is because unfortunately, a lot of times I like to play God. I like to call the shots. And any of you who are control freaks, I think it would probably be a significant number of you, if we were honest. What we don't recognize is what we're doing. We're doing the very same thing that Lucifer did in the Old Testament, which is I want to be like God. And the problem is I don't make a very good God, and neither do you. Neither do you. Think about it. No matter how much you, you guilt you throw in someone's way, no matter how many times you, you threaten them, like, do you have the power to change your spouse? Nope. Does God have the power and the ability to change your spouse? Absolutely. Do you, as helicoptery as you may be, mom, do you have the ability to control your child's future? The answer is no. Does God have the ability to open doors and close doors to direct your child's life? Absolutely. Do you have the power to manipulate, to control, to threaten, to guilt someone into quitting an addiction? Nope. But God does. Through, through the power of Christ, like we have the ability, he has the ability to make someone new. Like the old is gone and set them free from the power of darkness. That's why our number one calling in this life is to point people to Jesus because he's the only one that has the ability to do that. And so when we recognize, listen, that we don't have the power to control, we stop trying to be like God and we surrender to him. And I think that's why the very next thing Jesus said to his disciples after he had this encounter with Peter he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In other words, you, you can't be your own God anymore. And just like Jesus would say, just like I'm going to have to lay down my life, and just like God's going to raise me up, you too have to take up your cross and follow me. Essentially, what he's saying is if, if you want to follow Jesus, you can't be in control anymore. You can't be God. From that moment on, it's his will, not mine. And Jesus, when he was in the garden, he was praying, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. Why is that so important? Because anytime we let someone wrongly control us, or anytime we try to control someone else, essentially we're trying to be God. But the only way we can truly follow him is to surrender our will to his will. 
not to try to control someone else, but entrust them to him, to pray for them, to love them appropriately with, without entering into dysfunction. To say, I'm just gonna have to trust that the spirit of God, that he's gonna do a work in you. I can't control you. And right now, it's about dying to, to self. It's about getting rid of, of my own desires and just pointing you to Jesus. It's no longer about what I want, but it's about what he wants. And this morning, what, what he wants for many of you is to stop trying to control even the things in your own life. Like some of you, you've been holding on to, to sin for a long time. And, and you had this thought, this opinion that, hey, I can control that. The truth is you can't. And it's time to submit that to God. It's time to turn it over to him. For some of you, it's a relationship where you need to, before you walk out the door today, you need to say, I'm drawing a line in the sand. And we're gonna, because I love you, we're gonna stop this because it's not healthy. For some of you, it is to, to call somebody and say, hey, I'm sorry that I've been trying to control you and I haven't been doing, uh, I haven't been treating you the way that I should be. And I said, I don't know what decision you need to make today, but I know this is an area, this is we're in relationships that we have to do something about. We have to get it right because that's what the world's looking at. If we're gonna point people to Jesus, if we're gonna be light in a very dark world, we have to get this right. So I'm gonna ask you to stand this morning and we're gonna pray. And this isn't my will, like God's will, God's desire is that every one of us would come to repentance. So we wanna offer that to you today, to, to come to, to repent, to confess that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, that he's the only one that has power over sin and darkness, to, to be immersed uh, in, in baptism today for the forgiveness of those sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So whatever decision you need to make today, I'm gonna pray. Father God, we're thankful today uh, for who you are, for your desire for our life. Well, I pray today you would make very clear to each and every one of us uh, your calling on our life, that it is to, to continually point people to you through Jesus Christ, that we would d deny ourself and lift him up above everything so that people can see him through us. Well, I pray, God, that you would forgive us, myself included, when we try to play God, when we think that our way is better than your way. Or I pray for forgiveness and ask for forgiveness for, for us today who have been controlling other people through threats and guilt and manipulation. I pray for those today that, that need boldness to draw a line in the sand and put a stop to some dysfunctional relationships. Lord, I'm thankful for the example that we have in Jesus, that he was willing to lay down his life for us. And it's in his name that I pray, amen.